Welcome to How to Ruin Your Own Reputation, the show where I talk to people who are living lives that some people just don't quite understand and can often be criticized or judged for it. But the only way we're going to learn is if we listen. Today, I am very excited to be talking to my guest, Chris Angel Murphy. They are, among other things, a speaker, a trainer, an advocate, and host of the critically acclaimed podcast, Allyship is a Verb. Chris Angel is also queer, transgender, and non-binary. And so they know what it's like to evolve and change and figure out who you are while also trying to figure out where you fit in. And I know that a lot of people feel that way on different levels. I know I have, I still do. So we're going to talk about allyship and labels and just figuring out who you are in this crazy, crazy world. So welcome, Chris Angel, to my show. I'm so happy that you're here to speak with me. Thank you so much for having me on. I've been looking forward to this conversation, so I'm excited to see where we go. <laughs> and let's see where we go. I mean, the first yes. thing I, I want to talk about is maybe labels and how our society likes to put labels on things like and people. I think that it gives some people a sense of maybe order. They like to see that everything has its place, that every person has their place, and they feel safe with that. And then there are those of us who have the opposite feeling and don't, maybe we spend our whole lives trying to fit a label until we realize maybe we don't, or maybe we fit one and then we change into something else. And what's been your experience with that? Yeah, I think that labels can be gifts in a few ways because I think they can help us to find community. I think they yeah. can help us to explain our experience in a nutshell while holding space for nuance and that we may have a different definition, for example, of what a particular label means to us. And I'm also holding space for this is my social worker coming out and also because of like <laughs> a million therapist friends, but I'm also holding space for the fact that it can also get really overwhelming. I think about when I was first more intentionally learning about the LGBTQ plus community in the early 2000s. And even then it felt overwhelming to me. And I was wondering like, what am I going to get right or wrong? And I was focusing more on sexuality at that time. I wasn't even like questioning my gender yet. Although to that point, tomboy was the best term for me, but it was a label that was placed on me. And so I embraced it, but it came with a lot. And so, yeah, I find now there's also a part of me that's like words. Why do we need more words? And even as someone who's like a trainer and speaker and consultant, a perfect example I can give you. We have what's considered either the bi plus or multisexual spectrum. Sometimes it's shortened to M spec. And under that umbrella contains identities like bisexual, pansexual, omnisexual. To me, personal opinion, to me, the nuance between the of these like terms is just very small. Like I don't think they're too different from each other. I think they complement each other well. And I think sometimes even with like bisexual, people have a different definition than from what I would educate folks on. Mm. And then you have something like lesbian. And mm. that was one of the first communities I embraced because I thought I was part of it. And I was also kind of peer pressured into it, oddly enough. And so at that point, I would have told you in the early 2000s that lesbian meant women who love other women. Now I have a completely different answer for you. And part of that is because there was a recent extension that for some folks, lesbian can also include non-men. And that hurts my brain because I'm like, we have these, to me, again, seemingly smaller differences between the M-spec identities, but then lesbian, like to me, tacking on non-men is a huge shift. And I think folks who maybe have been in the community for a long time, like, I don't know how they feel about that. I don't know who makes these decisions either. But to me, that would have warranted a new word, which, again, more words, why? But also, again, yeah. for the reasons I stated previously of community and being able to give someone a gist of who we are. It's interesting that you say that because I know that there is some divisiveness within the LGBTQ plus community. And oh, there's so much I'm, infighting. So much. And I was kind of surprised because I'm newer to this. <laughs> to the gay community and so it it is was sort of surprising to me although it was also kind of warned about it but i wonder if part of that is because of all the words being added or maybe there aren't enough words and we're including everyone now if somebody because i do know some women who identify as lesbian and have for all of their lives and men are feeling like mm, it now it's including 
all these other definitions into it. And it's kind of like, no, no, we worked really, really, really hard to own this. And now we kind of don't want to share it. And that's not a bad, I'm not criticizing that. That's kind of like, you know, we, we worked for this to have respect for this. So maybe you come up with your own thing, but there are, there are so many words <laughs> and you're right with the whole bisexual, pansexual. I, I find that I looked, we were talking earlier. I Googled it. I still don't understand it. <laughs> I still don't see the difference. But yeah. as you said, I bet if you were to ask 10 different people, you're going to get 10 different definitions. Yeah. And typically what I do, like I was literally doing an LGBTQ plus one-on-one training the other day. And one of the things I emphasize is I don't go into the nitty gritty of the definitions too much, more broader concepts, like even just, you know, breaking down gender, you have gender attribution, you have gender expression, Mm. gender identity, gender, there's like sex assigned at birth, and just all these things that come together to give us tools to explain certain experiences of it. And it's just really interesting because my whole thing is I defer people to PFLAG. It's a wonderful national organization. They offer support groups. They have over 400 chapters. They do education. They do advocacy. They have wonderful publications for people. So for example, if someone's grandchild is is coming out to them and they're not sure what are these, again, these words and all this, we didn't have this in my generation, whatever. There's like publications for them. They're in English, they're in Spanish, they're amazing. They also have a glossary. And I love it because there's a lot of terms there. And I think it's a, a grounding place for people to start. But even when I'm training therapists or when I'm helping to teach people, here's how you support someone if they invite you in or disclose to you that they're part of this community. Here's what you can do. First, I always say thank them. And if it's a newer identity to you, or maybe you have some misconceptions about it because maybe you think you know, rather than making someone like your personal Google, instead of saying, you know what, I'm not really familiar with it. Can you tell me more about it? I educate people to instead say, what does that term mean to you? Because I think it gives a deeper conversation. It focuses on that person's personal experience, which is a lot easier for them to speak about versus being on this pedestal on behalf of a community, which no one can do, not even myself. And so then it warrants a deeper conversation because based on age, geographical location, all these other intersections, even if we had 50 lesbians in the room, because let's go with it, right? You may see some overall general themes, But people are going to have different aspects that they focus on in that definition for themselves. And I think that's more important than getting lost in the weeds of, wait, this means what, that means what, just being open to the person sharing their experience with you if they want to. Yeah, I think it's a good jumping off point, like to to maybe do some research so you have an idea and then say to the person, okay, but what does it mean to you? Because I think also if if you do your research and then you assume, okay, this is what it means. And then you're putting that on, on the other person when it's like, well, that's not really what it means for me. Because I do think we are so unique and it is the little things about us that, that could be different. One thing I want to say, though, too, to people who are listening is, is this. You don't have to completely understand something to respect it. And I think, I think that's something that's really missing in our society. It's like people say, oh, I don't get it. It's crazy. It's crazy. I don't get it. But you don't have to get it. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. You don't have to understand somebody's life. You don't to in order to say, but I support you. That's it. I agree. But speaking of understanding. So we were talking earlier about how you identify as queer, trans and non-binary. And I think the thing that's that could be kind of confusing is the the combination of transgender so transitioning into question mark. male, <laughs> but yeah, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm, yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to, um, but then, but then feeling non-binary. So can you mm-hmm. explain sort of how that evolved for you? Oh yeah. I mean, this is actually <laughs> evolving all over again for really interesting reasons. So non-binary for me means that I don't want to be put in a box. I think that sometimes when folks see a non-binary character in media, usually it's someone white, thin, androgynous presenting, and then folks feel like, okay, that's non-binary. So I'm going to look for people to fit that very narrow description of it. And that's not it Mm. for me. For me, it's saying I don't want to exist in the binary of man and woman because it doesn't 
feel encompassing for me. I just want to like float around and be this like, I don't know, blob, if you will. And rather than people saying, okay, you look like a man to me, so I'm going to treat you like a man. I don't want any of that. I just want to be treated like a human being. And I want people to be able to just get to know me as a person and know what honors me individually as a person. And so I know that folks get caught up on my beard. I know they get caught up on my dress and how I present my gender because they would associate it to be with masculinity or how men might dress. But something very critical happened for me over this past year. During the course of the pandemic, I've figured out that I'm ADHD and autistic. And this was critical because I felt broken my whole life for different reasons. And I knew that finding the LGBTQ plus community broadly helped open a big pocket of community. But there's always been something still kind of missing for me. And I always just like thought, well, maybe I'll find that community someday. There's actually a huge overlap between the neurodivergence community space and also the LGBTQ plus. Like folks who are autistic tend to be, I think it's, I don't know, they tend to be more likely to be gender expansive or trans or, or something like that. And now that as I've been sharing my story and what it means for me, as I've been unraveling all of this, it's helping a lot of my friends figure this out about themselves too. That either maybe they're recognizing like, oh, why is this like relatable to me? Oh, I think I'm ADHD too. Or maybe they think they're autistic as well. And I mean, that's just a huge honor for me, but all that to say, I now understand historically, if you would have asked me, five years ago, seven years ago, when I'm thinking about my presentation, like what is the thought process behind it? it you know, with medical transitions, and I'm, I'm happy to talk about that, but normally you wouldn't ask folks about it. Thinking about that, like what was the motivation? And honestly, a lot of it's sensory stuff. And so like with autism and even just any neurodivergence, we can be overwhelmed by different things, like really strong sense, like bright fluorescent lighting. Like I even like hear electricity, but I didn't realize that like other people mm -hmm. can't hear electricity. So I'm like, oh, OK, cool. Always <laughs> got to be different. Way to go, Chris Angel. And so <laughs> now I would say instead of me trying to remove parts of myself that people would equate with femininity or womanhood or, or whatever, girlhood, et cetera. It's, it's not about that because I don't want to say that like the male body, for example, is like the default and the neutral option. That's not what I'm going for. What I'm going for is I want better sensory experiences. So for me, having top surgery to remove my chest or to flatten my chest rather was very important for me from a sensory perspective. Same thing, having my period wasn't a very good experience for me. And I know there's a lot of folks out there who menstruate that also don't like it. But to me, it was at such a level of distress that it was important for me to have access to a full hysterectomy. And that was the right decision okay. for me. And so like when I'm going and picking out clothing, I'm not like, ick, girls' clothes or ick, women's <laughs> clothes. It's more that when we're looking at the fashion industry, when we're looking at girls' and women's clothing in particular, a lot of it tends to be bright colors. It tends to be very uncomfortable fabric because more money is spent toward, like, the shaping, extras on it, like, I don't know, puffs or something, right? Whatever's in style that season. And so to try to make it budget-friendly then you lose money with the quality of the fabric. Whereas typically with what we call boys' and men's clothing, which has no gender, by the way, but when we call it that, then it tends to be more comfortable. It tends to be in, in terms of the fit, in terms of the material used, the colors are easier on my eyes. It's just like a better experience overall. So I'm not trying to be a guy. I'm not trying to be masculine. I'm chasing after what is the best sensory experience for myself. And that even goes into my sexuality as well. So now that I understand this about myself, and this is literally as recent as... September of 2022, it's so much easier for me to explain my experience. But here's the challenge, though. So if I'd had the same language back in the early 2010s when I was seeking hormone replacement therapy and just all of my medical transition stuff, because I've been on testosterone since August of 2008. It's been a long time. If I had said and explained my gender in this way, especially with the autism piece, I would not have had access. There is so much medical gatekeeping. And even oh. today, sharing this, there's many surgeons and doctors that would say, you know what, it sounds like you have some mental health stuff to figure out. 
I don't think you're well enough to seek out care, but this was the right move for me. And I know with certainty there's other folks because I've been finding them and we've been talking about this and it feels nice to have that language and, and understand what my motivations are. That was a lot. <laughs> no, it's great because I know I'm thinking for me, you clarified so much and, and tell me if I kind of understand a little bit more. I, what I'm hearing is that it's, as you said, it's not about transitioning into a what looks like a man. It's you feeling comfortable in your own skin, yeah. and whatever it, what however that manifested, you did what would make Chris Angel feel comfortable in their own body. Period. Yes. And so yeah. you did that, and then being in your body the way that feels right for you, you also feel non binary that is mm -hmm. that is how you feel that is how you present yourself that is how you identify to me yeah and that's today <laughs> and that's right. just today in my right. early 20s i'm going to be 36 this year for context in my early 20s i first took on gender queer and for me how i've perceived it is i'm actively queering my gender i'm too lazy for that i'm tired so i just decided over time maybe that wasn't the fit but again these are just my definitions for me and why i chose these and it's not because these are new concepts it's not because anything's wrong with me it's nothing like that it's purely just that i mean number one especially right now we're seeing actively our history being erased because we have these don't say gay laws that are sweeping across the nation among other things and anti-trans legislation etc it's it's really awful and it's everywhere mm -hmm. it just feels like every day i'm learning about like several new ones that are being introduced but it's it's just really interesting because i think that there's just a lot of double standards here because when we think about gender affirming care, cisgender people, which by definition currently means folks that were assigned a particular sex at birth and it's in alignment with their gender. So like if a person was assigned male at birth and is a boy, becomes a man, right, we would call that person cisgender. I think a lot of people think it's a slur and it's like, it's just a term <laughs> really at the end of the day. It's it's not a slur or anything, but, you know, they can get they can also get access to gender affirming care and surgeries because sometimes folks don't produce enough of their own hormones. They may have like a thyroid issue or something that needs to be corrected. It could be that mm -hmm. someone wants a, a boob job. Someone wants mm -hmm. a nose job. Right. And so that's all gender affirming care. And so like we don't question or blink you know, an eye at that, but oh, trans people, oh no, you're sick, we have to, and then don't even get me started on like intersex issues and how there's like forced genital mutilation and everything happening without their consent very early on. So it's just a lot. And so the double standards are where I get particularly upset because it's like, if you're banning it for trans people, understand that like cisgender people are getting that same care for the same reasons. They just want to feel more comfortable in their body. I go back to labels for a second because I think if there's anything that that I'm I'm learning when I look at the younger generation and and there will be people who will criticize it and say oh everyone's gay now and everyone's queer and so I don't see the negative part of that and I and it's fear it all comes from fear and I and I don't understand that because again what someone else is doing with their life that isn't harming anyone else I, I don't see how that disrupts someone else's life but there is this fear of change with with so many people. Mm -hmm. I know for myself, like I thought I had to pick a label and I kind of did. And now I'm comfortable with queer and that's it. Like that's, I don't have to explain it. I don't have to justify it. I don't have to validate it. I know what it means for me. And, and it, and it, and it does evolve and change. And I used to think that that wasn't right, but now I'm like, no, screw it. I'm going to be 53 in a few months. So, you know, if you're going to judge me, judge me, but, but I'm comfortable with not knowing exactly who I want to be when I grow up, but I'm having fun figuring it out. You know, absolutely. And I think even expanding on the definition of queer, I think there's several definitions, including that myself, I would describe. I know that the term lifestyle gets a really bad reputation. But when you look up the definition, it's talking about a group or a culture that's living their life in a particular way, like just the same way we would say someone's having a healthy lifestyle. And we won't even touch that one because that comes with a lot of baggage yes. and, and everything. <laughs> However, sticking to queer lifestyle, which again is a recent reclamation because I think there is a queer lifestyle. To me, what it offers is this buffet of options. It offers 
People can be polyamorous. They can be getting a house with their best friend. They don't have to be married and have kids and dogs and the white fence or whatever. They can have different, again, lifestyles. And so when people get so scared of queerness as a lifestyle, I think it's liberating. And the more that I embrace queerness, it's just liberating. It's giving people options. You can try it and decide it's not for you. And you can also not try things and decide it's it's not for you. But giving people the freedom to explore who they are, labels, gender, all of it, like I just think it's it's really liberating. And it's not only just for ourselves, but other folks. And I think that because of the pandemic, I think one of the good things that have come out as a result of this is I think folks are have had time to learn more about themselves and go a little bit deeper. So whereas usually a medical or social transition for someone who's transgender or exploring that, usually it's a very public thing. They got to try it more privately mm -hmm. without all of these eyes on them. And if they were able to access, again, perfectly safe access to gender affirming surgeries and just medical care period, then there's a lot less of that in between and the harassment that can happen, the bullying, everything like fearing for their life. Like I know when I was living in a more androgynous state, it was awful. I had people placing bets to see which bathroom I was going to go into. When yeah. I was a barista, I had customers in front of me arguing about my gender. I was like, I can answer. I know. <laughs> but, you know, just all the time, people are constantly like, is that a boy or girl? Like everything came back to that. And it's like, who cares? I'm just trying to get your drink order and like, get you go to the bar. So when it's ready, it can be handed off to you. Like, what difference does my gender make in this transaction? None. So, yeah, I just come back to queerness is just liberating. I'm not trying to like indoctrinate anyone into this lifestyle or anything. It's just like, again, different ways to live your life. I'm thinking about all of the grooming talk, which is so yeah. infuriating to me. And, and <laughs> whenever they talk about introducing a book in school about like my two dads, and it's like, oh, we're gonna, we're gonna turn these kids gay. It's like, what about all the million books <laughs> with a mom and a dad? There are still gay kids. So that that theory is out the window. But yes. do you think, or how would you, how would you explain that you're not too young to know who you are? Or do you think maybe you are too young to know who you are? I mean, how, how do you feel? What do you think about starting the transition process? When it comes to medical proof that like there's a gay gene or a trans gene or whatever, I think that it feels incredibly invalidating because I know who I am and I don't need science to prove it. However, we do know that children can know their gender as young as three or four and know that they're transgender. Mm. And I think some of the biggest fears are, and for parents especially, and I know this because I've spoken with them directly, and it's part of what I do in my training and everything, is they're worried, what if my kid is just going through a phase. What if I'm doing the wrong thing? What if I'm actually causing harm to my child? Because I don't think parenting is an easy gig. And I think that every year it gets more and more complicated. And so I don't want to be a parent unless it's like fur babies, like dogs, right. cats, et cetera. <laughs> my, fr my friend was like, do you want fur babies or skin babies? And that's like a whole different visual. <laughs> so I'm like, I don't know. There can be like hairless cats and stuff, but I digress. See, here's the ADHD coming in. But that said, I think it's perfectly okay to allow kids to explore gender. I think it's encouraged. And it's not because, I mean, I do have a friend who is terribly disappointed that both of her kids so far are very straight and very binary. I think she was really rooting. And in fact, I know she was rooting for like queer kids. <laughs> Sorry, friend. She knows who she is. We'll still cross our fingers for her. But, you know, <laughs> that said, because she's also just a wonderful ally. But yeah, we can't force anything on them. I think it's a shame, though, if we say, OK, well, we can play dress up. We can have you wear dresses. You can play with nail polish and stuff, but it can only happen at home because then we're starting to teach them that this is something to be shame, shame, you know, have shame around or have guilt around. And, and we don't want to do that. And so the quickest way I think I can get to this is that when we're thinking about transition, really, there's three components to it. There's a legal transition, which would include one's sex or gender marker and the legal name that they go by. So there's that piece. Then there's a medical transition, which is, I think, where people go first. They always think surgery, you like things that you can't like undo hormones, et cetera, mm. right? And then there's also social transition. So when you have kids exploring their gender, they're not having surgeries. 
That's not right. happening. What's happening is social transition. So maybe they're trying out a different name. They're trying out different pronoun sets. They're getting a haircut, which can be so gender affirming for people. I know every time I have a really good haircut, I'm like, yes, I feel powerful. I don't know what it is, right? We just walk differently. You know, it's allowing them to try on the clothing that they want to and not saying, well, you're a little girl, so you can only wear girls clothing, which again, clothing has no gender. So all of that said, we're also not trying to make like these sad, beige, bland, boring children children either. Like gender exploration can be really, really fun. And so it could be that a boy decides he wants to wear dresses sometimes and skirts or tutus and then like decides one day it's not for him anymore. But that's not a surgery and that's not what's happening. So when we do get to any kind of medical transition, typically it's happening in the teens. And the only thing that's happening at that point is they have access to something called puberty blockers, which are completely safe. And they've been studied for a very long time now. It's delaying the onset of puberty so that if we can reduce any harm caused to if they started developing breasts, for example, it's much better that we can you know, delay that versus force them into a body that they know they're not going to feel comfortable in. It also gives everyone a moment to pause and say, cool, how is this feeling? Is this feeling affirming? Yeah. Then later on, usually when they're 18 or so, if they want to have access to medical care, like having a surgery, then it's an option they can start to explore. And here's the thing. Parents can either get on board with this and support their kid and love them unconditionally, or they can be their first bully. And I'd rather them choose unconditional love. And like you said, even if they don't understand it, they want their kid to be happy. Their kid's going to do whatever they're going to do when they're 18 anyway. So why not support them through this thing that is completely harmless? Society is the issue. I think a lot mm -hmm. of folks think, you know, we're broken. We have all these issues. I literally only go to therapy because society doesn't want me here. That's what it feels like, especially with all this anti-trans and anti-LGBTQ plus legislation. To me, it's saying, yeah, we don't want you here. And that's a horrible message to receive every day, several times a day. So it's funny. It's funny because they say they say therapy is people who go to therapy go because of people who won't go to therapy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Uh, it, it, I, I'm listening and it's what I'm thinking about is how we have grown up, especially me being born in the 70s, 70s. Uh, in such with such a binary system in that it's funny if you were talk to my kids they would tell you that I was a tomboy I always talk about how I was a tomboy and I I didn't play with Barbies I played I loved football and I I did kind of let's say I, I mean I danced and I sang but I did a lot of I remember thinking oh my I loved my bike it was navy and I purposely didn't want pink and all but I knew I was a girl right you know so and that so that's that, I'm cisgender I knew I was a girl but I could like quote unquote, boy things. And I think that going back to the fear, I think there are a lot of adults who get fearful if they have a little boy who wants to wear an ampoule wear it. Oh, either they're gay or they're trans. Well, maybe they're, maybe, but maybe not. Maybe they just like those things. And I think change is very scary. But as you were just saying, and, and as I said, I love that younger people are getting this chance to explore in a way that we didn't. I, I used to do body image workshops at schools and I used to talk about some gender stuff a long time ago. And I remember a little girl telling me she was so upset when she was at the toy store way back when they were, I don't even know if they are anymore, but it was one side blue, one side pink yep. in the toy store. And she's like, I wanted a Buzz Lightyear toy, but I had to go into the, the boy section, you know? And it was like, that's so silly. Or another girl was like, I climb trees and I get teased for it, but I don't care. And it's like, it's so weird that at such a young age, we're telling them how to be a boy, how to be, how to be a person. Mm -hmm. Whereas now we're saying, just do, just be. And, and we as adults have to learn how to, how to go with that. I want you to tell people about your podcast, because as I said, I've been listening to it and I, I, I think it's super powerful and um, Thank you. really educational. So tell, tell people about it. Yeah, thank Please. you. So the name of it is Allyship is a Verb. And basically what I do is I have conversations with people from the LGBTQ plus community about their experiences and about their various intersections. So it's not even just people who are in the LGBTQ plus community, but they're also Black or Samoan and you know, deaf or a wheelchair user or whatever the situation is and holding space for all those complexities. And then each episode ends in a tip that they share out that would ideally be something that honors them as a person 
because I think one of the other things we can do when someone shares something personal with us outside of thanking them for sharing something so personal is offering support. But we all need different kinds of support, or maybe we're good and we don't need anything. And so maybe it could be like that a coworker shares something with you and you say, thank you. And then you say, do you need any support telling anyone else? You know, but only offering that if that's something that you feel like you could do and you think would honor that person. And that's why one of the biggest allyship tips I personally tout all the time is a lot of us are familiar with the golden rule, right? And we've heard variations of like, the same idea is basically treat others the way you want to be treated. Well, I probably don't want to be treated the same way that you do, right? So then I came across the platinum rule years and years ago now, and that says treat others the way they want to be treated. And it's just Ooh. a simple shift, but I'm like, yes, because we're not all honored by the same actions. We don't all need the same support. And so I love that. And so, yeah, just taking the time to get curious and ask someone what kind of support you need, I think that's really powerful. And so that's what the the podcast is getting at, is that I think now, especially because of things like Me Too, all these other movements that we've been seeing, and then you have like cancel culture going around, people are getting worried about it. I personally feel I don't like cancel culture as a concept because I don't want to inherently believe that someone is disposable. I do believe in holding people mm -hmm. accountable. I couldn't give you all the answers to what that looks like and the levels of that. Okay. However, that said, people are also going to make mistakes. We're absolutely yeah. going to make mistakes. So it's like here, here's like the formula for how you can offer an authentic apology. Here's how, you know, you can do this thing differently in the future. But like another quick example is if someone gets my name wrong, because, you know, it trips people up that my first name is Chris Angel, right? They're always like, Chris, I'm like, no, Chris Angel. If they catch themselves, all they have to do is self-correct and move on. But sometimes people think they need to like launch into their acting debut and like this whole monologue. About, <laughs> I'm just so sorry. Oh, my God. And like you're drawing all this attention to it. Just correct yourself and keep going. It's really okay. Cause in that way, number one, you're role modeling it for other people. And number two, you're saving me the emotional labor of having to correct you, which I hate having to do that because it's like everywhere. So all that said, that's really what the podcast is about. It's just humanizing it. It's funny because you're talking about making mistakes. And, and as you know, right before we started, I said, if I screw up, if I say something wrong, please correct me. But, but you don't want people to be afraid of engaging in conversation because they're going to say the wrong thing. You want to engage in conversation. So I think there, there does have to be that level of comfort to A, not be defensive if you are corrected. And like you said, <laughs> don't put the other person in the position of having to say, no, it's okay. It's okay. I'm okay. Like that's, that's the problem too. It's just correct and, and move on. I think sometimes there's so much overthinking and that's the problem. Like don't overthink it. It's not that tough. It's not as complicated as I think we tend to make it sometimes. Rather. Absolutely. I mean, rather than apologizing, I encourage people to first just say thank you, because right. I think feedback is a gift. You know, let's just lean on all the cliches. But <laughs> I do. And so rather than saying I'm sorry, because then I'm further having to like console you, right? And not not you specifically, but the general okay. person I'd be talking with. And so rather just say thank you, if you feel like you need to acknowledge it. But you know, there's there's just better ways of apologizing because I know some of the most upsetting apologies I get are, I'm sorry, but you know, this is just so hard for me. And like, I don't care about that. And you just voided the apology. That's not an apology. To me, part of the formula is, oops, I'm acknowledging I just made this mistake. Ouch. I'm recognizing how it's likely impacted you. And I'm sorry, rather than even saying those words is, here's what I'm going to do moving forward about this. So again, if it's because of my name being Chris Angel or my pronouns being they, them, I'm going to practice with someone so that I don't make the same mistake in the future. But not something, again, that you're going to promise, like, I'm never going to make a mistake again, but that you're committing that you're right here now, you're going to do the work. Because that's the biggest thing is practice. I have a friend now who uses no pronouns. That is blowing my mind and it's great. And I know that that's a thing and I've known that for a long time, but this is the first time I now actively have a friend that's not using pronouns. And so I have to think and I just pause and I slow down and I'm just very careful with my verbiage. Mm -hmm. And if I make a mistake, I correct myself and that's it. So I also make mistakes. We're so hardwired yeah, and programmed. 
well, I think what's also tough is it, it is very individualized. So I had heard that before. It's better to say thank you, like thank you for correcting me and moving on than, mm-hmm. than to say I'm sorry. That might not be the case with everybody. I know I'm, right. I'm, I have a friend whose son has autism. And I say it that way because I remember years and years ago saying something like about somebody being autistic. And to mm-hmm. her, she doesn't, that's not what she goes by. She doesn't feel like he is autistic. Right. She feels he has autism. And so it's not who he is. And I respect that. I know other people who don't feel that way, who, right. who have autism. So it's it, that you have to be aware of too. You might say something to somebody and get corrected and then use what you've learned with someone else. And they might go, whoa, that's not. But still you go, yes. okay, so for this person, there's that. And then for that person, there's that. And it is it, because what it comes down to is we are, despite the communities we fit into, despite the label that we may wear, we are individual mm-hmm. and different things are going to work and feel good for each of us. And if you are, if you do care about somebody, then you're going to take the extra minute to pause and think of what, what works for them. Because all we want is for the people we love to be comfortable and safe, right? We just want everyone yeah. to feel safe with us. And that's what I guess being a good, a good ally is. And coming back to what I said at the beginning, you don't have to understand everything to be a good ally. You don't have to understand everything to be a support system and to be mm-hmm. a safe place. Yeah. I think one of the mistakes I tend to see over and over again is even someone needing to call themselves an ally. And to me, it's a grab for it's to me, it's no different than someone doing hashtag BLM or hashtag Black Lives Matter, hashtag stop Asian hate. That's great. But what are you doing about it? Right. Because a hashtag isn't going to stop it. Right. And so I'd rather you show me through your actions, whatever those may be, that you're an ally in that way. Because I think people get hung up on, but I'm a good ally and I would never mean harm. And it's like, you don't mean harm, but you're probably going to cause harm. So let's just acknowledge that. And rather than feeling like you need to carry this around as like, I don't know, a badge of honor or something, just do the work. The work will speak for itself. Then I'll know. That's, well, that's really that I simple. I, I would think that being a good ally with anything, it, it means doing the research, just learning as much as you can and standing up for it when you see it. Like you said, put it into action. It's not about what you post on Facebook. It's not about you know what you share on Instagram. It is about speaking up and, and saying something when you see it and stopping it when it's in your presence and learning. Learn. Yeah. That's why. That's why I have conversations like this because I think, we, as I said at the beginning, you can only the only way of getting rid of some of the judgment is by understanding people, and the only way you can understand somebody is by having conversations with them. And and the best way to have a conversation is to do some research first. But you have to want that. You have to want to understand somebody to to want to engage in a conversation. And I I'm I'm learning so much. And I, I really I want to thank you for speaking with me today because I've learned you clarified a lot for me. I've learned a lot from this conversation. And I'm going to be going to continue listening to allyship is a verb because it is it really is it's so educational but it's entertaining and I love your guests and I love your conversation. So is there anything before I let you go that you want to that you want to share? Well, first off, thank you. I don't want to skip over the fact that you just gave me some lovely feedback. So thank you so much for that. And outside of that, I think just if you're in a place of work that you think could use some support in this area, because I guarantee folks in the LGBTQ plus community are everywhere. They're your baristas, your attorneys, your neighbors, everyone. You think you don't know anyone, but I promise you, you've come across someone. It comes back to those ideas we have about people fitting in certain boxes and that like gay men can only be effeminate and hairstylists, whatever, because that's what we see on TV, right? There's not a lot of diversity there, but it's starting to come. But yeah, if you think, especially your place of work could use some support there, just contact me, you know, my website's Queer dot training, and I'd be happy to do something like an LGBTQ plus 101 or something like that, assuming I'm a good fit because I'm silly. I, I have silly <laughs> props. I have I use memes. I sometimes I do like horrible singing. It just really depends what's going to come out that day. But I, oh, I think great. part. 
Yeah. Well, and I think going back to your point, it's been very clear to me that you believe education is absolutely one of the ways that we can get there. And I think part of it, too, is knowing that education is also very vulnerable. And so that's why I try to infuse a lot of humor into it, because I want to try to create a safer learning environment. For me, that's what I try to offer is a safer learning environment through humor. So, yeah, that's that's it. That's That's all I got. That's great. That's good. And we will have all your information, all your links in the show notes. So thank you so much, Chris Angel, for talking with me today and sharing your insight. I'm I'm so happy we connected. Thank you so much. Me too. Thank you so much, Marcy. And thank you everyone for listening. And I will see you next week and how to ruin your own reputation.